Uh, just for the sake of uh, clarification, uh, as you see uh, this firm on the, on the slide, I'm not an auditor. I'm a lawyer by education and uh, I'm heading uh, the legal practice for the financial services industry and everything we are doing at KPMG in Germany um, and cooperating with other firms in Austria, Switzerland as a third country and elsewhere, uh, everything what's about analyzing and implementing MIFID II these days. Um, and possibly just three brief remarks before we just enter into things I brought with you, with me, a little bit different from what we've seen before. So in terms of making things uh, colorful in addition, uh, hopefully as serious as, as it has been all the time, um, just I show you some pictures and things uh, like this. Three remarks po possibly briefly on what we discussed before. First of all, uh, the issue about investor protection and customer consumer protection. For me, you know, this is a very practical uh, thing to answer. I always say, you know, it, it may be a, a drafting error if someone talks about, sorry for this, just uh, investor protection uh, or consumer protection. I always say I may consume, you know, my apple juice and water. I may consume a, a bottle of wine or a glass of wine. I may consume olive oil. I may even, and as a German I need to say, consume a car. But I would never wish to consume my investment product because, you know, I want it at the end uh, even more valuable than in the beginning. I mean, that's a very simple thing, but, you know, talking about consumer protection in the world of financial instruments, from my point of view, is just uh, using the wrong term. But anyway. Uh, second point, why do we have a capital markets union, from my point of view, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, in addition to a banking union? What we find so interesting, and I've really been discussing with, with colleagues, with uh, the industry supervisors in possibly not 28 member states over the past years, but possibly 20. Um, we are facing the single rule book. We are trying to get ahead with supervisory convergence. But what, we, what did we uh, achieve yet? We, we, I mean, how many products, how many services from abroad are being taken by the, the clients, the customers in your countries? Uh, in Germany, the products I get, the things I'm offered, are from German providers normally. Of course, they are fund providers from Luxembourg, from Switzerland, from the US, whatever. But whenever do I get a loan from elsewhere than from a German bank? You know, whenever do I get something from abroad? I think there's just a mismatch between uh, the uniformity and the increasing uniformity of increasing rules and the way the markets just work. And in my understanding, that's the purpose of the Capital Markets Union, to make it more matching, hopefully. Um, as and finally, I mean, it was mentioned before, supervision is difficult these days, uh, and it's difficult for supervisors to manage all these, these things. I can uh, send you some greetings from those who need to comply with and who need to implement those rules in practice. And believe me, even for them, it is at least as difficult as for you. And not to be misunderstood further, I'm a one, and those who know me know that this is true, I'm not telling the clients, oh, the burden of the regulation and, oh, pfft, so cumbersome, you know, so costly, and, and, and. I'm trying to tell people, look, what is behind, what is the message behind and the intention behind MIFID II? It's not just to, to impose an additional burden on you, which may lead, really, in fact, to the business then shrinking together instead of being more enhanced uh, in the face-to-face -face situation uh, with, with the client. Um, I always tell people, look, this is meant to show you that you can be much more client-centric than ever before, you know. Do you really know what your, your client's interests are? Do you really know which products are, are good for people? Uh, or is it just an exercise of, you know, loading with information? And, I mean, a number of things have been mentioned before, and I'm very convinced about this. And I always say, and I think this was mentioned before, and then I'm starting with the slides um, briefly and quickly, um, financial products you know, at least from a German perspective, and I believe it is similar elsewhere, they are not being bought, they are being sold. And the seller calls himself advisor. And that's one of the just practical problems about everything you try to regulate while practice is different. Having said this, let's look what I brought with me in terms of... Um, I try to just as a certain kind of framing for the other things we have discussed and are going to discuss. Uh, just a brief introduction. We have seen a number of things already. Just that you understand, you know, the frame of what I'm talking about, where I come from, 
uh, in terms of um, analyzing uh, things and thinking of, about it. Sorry. And then we got the two important, the, the two big slices we have been uh, cutting for the purposes of this presentation from the overall MIFID II world, uh, you know, which I uh, called investment services and conduct of business obligations firstly and then uh, possibly the most important uh, in this context then, other than of course product governance and other things, conflicts in, of interest and in particular uh, our very favorite topic, inducements. So, so let's go on that. Um, I mean, what we're talking about, just to remind anyone, and as simple as it is, I always say, this is not all rocket science, and the more we are clear about what we're really talking about and not you know, using sophisticated terms and anyone has a different thought uh, and, and different picture in one's head, as simple as it is, this is the three-party world about which is MIFID normally, and we're talking, of course, about investor protection here, not about markets and trading issues end and end. And there's the product manufacturer, there's the intermediary, and there's the client. And the existing MIFID I world, I would say, mainly, and this is a distribution regulation, governs what is on the right-hand side. You know, the relationship and the conduct between the intermediary and the client, and now we see this being enhanced, and I'll show you another slide in a moment, um, uh, about, of course, the manufacturer. And at the same time, the manufacturer, of course, already has one's own regulation with USITS, AIFMD, and so on. And we talk about PRIPs later today. From my perception, in essence, this is all about conflicts of interest uh, and costs today. Conflicts of interest, you know, of course, the intermediary, the product manufacturer, anyone needs to, to, to earn money. And of course, those people need to pay bills of advisors into ALIA, so therefore, th that's fair enough. Um, and they need to be able to pay the burden of supervision these days. And then on the other hand, of course, um, the investor wants to have a good, good deal at the same time. Brackets, although the investor normally doesn't know what's a good deal for him or her, brackets. Um, and just on the left-hand side, I, I borrowed it from uh, Finance Watch some years ago already, and I still keep it because I don't find it being presented more precisely and more to the point what's all at stake here. And on the right-hand side, to be politically uh, very neutral and correct, uh, this is Mr. Ferber from uh, the, the German CSU from Bavaria, uh, very uh, down-to-earth person. Uh, I, I have had the, the possibility to meet him a number of occasions over the past years and discuss things. What do we see on the left-hand side? I mean, this is again a three-party uh, constellation there. Um, and of course, this is a bit more black and white, as everything I'm telling you here for, for the, in, in the sense of time and, and to be to, to put it, bring it to the point, is, is somehow black and white, of course. Uh, you know, three products available. Um, one, of course, one product uh, has, a, has a much better commission uh, than the others, uh, and two, you know, with the lower commission. Um, and again, many things um, are about framing. You may have heard about it. If I'm offered a product which um, is alleged to provide 10% return, another one 12%, and the third product 3% return. And if it, is, if it happens today, normally I should be aware that 3% that is the only thing which is somehow realistic yeah, in the world without uh, interest. Um, but due to the framing, if you present this to an investor, it is quite likely that one wouldn't select from one's own the 3% return product. Here we're talking about the commission. Um, and what happens? The advisor uh, advises and recommends that product B is in the best interest of of the investor. Three points of interest here. Point one, you regulate the inducement which is being paid here, the commission as such. We come to this later. Secondly, it is a matter of cost transparency. You need to tell, I mean, of inducement transparency as, a, as an additional requirement of inducements. Um, and then of cost transparency, which is a regulatory aspect as such. And thirdly, you can talk about suitability here. Is the product with the highest commission suitable? And as to the practice of my audit colleagues, my own practice, and as I know it from the German regulator and others, I would put it very straightforward the way uh, I would do it now. And for the purposes of, for example, the German Federal High Court, which is rather strict and even stricter in terms of you know, informing clients about details, about suitable uh, investment uh, decisions and products, if the advisor is picking up the product B, and each of these products are, other than with respect to the commission, equally suitable 
for that client, for that lady. And the 1,000 euros are disclosed as a commission. Then, as far as I understand, you will do anything, everything right in terms of securities regulation as of today under MIFID 1, uh, including from a German perspective, for example, and possibly in Austrian, as far as I know about this, from a civil law perspective. You will not be uh, able to be sued uh, but successfully by the investor. And so we have the feeling there's room for enhancement somehow. Yeah? And we come to MIFID 2 and we're talking about it all the time uh, in any of these respects I've mentioned before, of course, we see uh, enhancement. And this is what Mr. Ferber discovered and uh, I understand he has deleted that press release later from his website. Anyway, I printed it out and got it in my file in the office um, when he said, you know, provide the products not for the benefit of the intermediary but for the client and I think originally he said for the customer and so I needed to translate it my way. Uh, and very briefly again we, we touched upon this, with this uh, quite a lot before. You're aware of these levels uh, of, of the rulemaking and in some anticipation uh, when I was kind of revising my English uh, slides a few days before I put legislation, regulation and supervision so I possibly uh, sophisticatedly covered all these various aspects. Uh, and without going into any more detail of this slide, I just want to highlight uh, two points here, and these have all been mentioned before. Uh, my, my current favorites are the draft guidelines on product governance and um, the suitability requirements peer report, just for briefly for the following reasons. No, I'm not talking about uh, the contents of product governance. You will do so, uh, Salvatore, and we discussed it a lot before. Um, this is an example for what can go wrong in terms of uh, interaction between those who are on the field. The, the German industry um, became aware, um, for example, the German industry became aware last year that ESMA is preparing something more detailed on product governance, in particular, the target market. Um, and they appeared or they, they thought they became aware that this may come in the form of Q&A. And so, correct me if I'm telling, uh, telling wrong things, they try to convince ESMA by various means that this should be guidelines which need to be consulted other than Q&A, as you're aware, uh, so that one has uh, the possibility um, to just issue comments to provide a statement on that. So what happened? We may have seen guidelines um, six months ago by, issued by ESMA if they would just have been, uh, sorry, a Q&A, did I say guidelines, Q&A by ESMA, yeah, because you may have been ready th those days with something as a first Q&A draft, but then you, you followed the wish of, of those people um, uh, shouting loudly, you know, we need a consultation, uh, we want to, to, to tell you what we think about it. Then you did it properly right in terms of the process. You issued, issued the draft guidelines. Then you received about 100 uh, responses, as I'm aware. You, you're analyzing them. And now you're in the process of coming closer to issuing then these kind of set of final guidelines. So people today, if I'm talking to, to people in Germany, they say, oh, pff, you know, it is, it is April, it is May, it is June, and we do not yet have any clarity about what is really meant with product governance with a target market. And then I say, yeah, that's right. But, I mean, if you think about it, Th this is somehow uh, your own fault, so to say. You know, if you wouldn't have tried to convince ESMA to go into this consultation process, which takes much longer, you may already be able to see it uh, on your desk. And so this is, you know, on the one hand, of course, you know, one has been able to provide one's thoughts and comments, and on the other hand, this makes it more lengthy. So you need to decide. I always say you need to die one death, and here this is the one and not the other. Normally, to be honest, I don't have the time, uh, and, and I'm happy to have some, some colleagues uh, whom I can ask to do so, but uh, to read annexes of peer review reports myself. Uh, for some reason, I had a look into the annex of the suitability requirements peer re review report, uh, and quite in the beginning, there, there have been three scenarios put forward by, by ESMA towards the national uh, competent authorities uh, in terms of do you consider this being an advice situation or not? You know, li something like with, a, with an IT-assisted um, tool, uh, you get to a product, then you are talking to an advisor and a third situation. And then there was a table of those 28 um, uh, NCAs, the countries, and then the three scenarios, and then it was just yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. 
and you can guess, you know, you know that you are two lawyers, you got three views, uh, you got 28 responses and you got so many combinations of yes, no, yes, no, yes. So people are entirely clear about in any single jurisdiction, at any single uh, uh, supervisory authority uh, in the member states where there's a situation where you have advice and where not and where you need suitability requirements, blah, blah. So this showed me, you know, there's much room uh, to, to work on still. And as it was mentioned before, I just put a screenshot. You all know it already, and I, I got it here um, last, last week. Um, we have been waiting a bit for that. As it appears to me, there has not been any kind of really relevant change to those drafts of last year. They have the three important ones for us, which have been already here in the middle um, of April and May last year. Uh, they stayed with the date of last year, and they are now here in the official journal uh, which you will be aware of. So what it, what it is about, um, very simply, there are a few kind of key concept, I concepts, I would say, uh, about MIFID II, and you are all uh, aware of these. Uh, I'm coming to a few of them here. Others are being addressed uh, by others, including just uh, following uh, my presentation in a few moments. Um, so... Let's go on. What I want to show you here, and then we are moving closer to looking at the clock, to, uh, closer to uh, the essence of uh, the things I brought with me in more detail. This is a, what I would say the, the MIFID I world as it is being implemented and supervised in a jurisdiction like, for example, Germany. Um, you see here, and the client is missing here, but this is the manufacturer and then what I would call the distribution organization, starting with the product selection, uh, organizing things, then the point of sale and after sales area. And this is here where the client, of course, comes into the game. Um, comes before into the game when you have him in, in, in your organization. But anyway, this is just in a, uh, in a typical way how, how this works in the product and sales life cycle, I understand. And this is a bit similar also to the one slide Salvatore also showed you. And the, the colored um, pieces and fields are those which show, which is, uh, as to my knowledge, what you need to comply with and what you're going to supervise under MIFID I as it exists today. So there was, in fact, some room for enhancing things and extending routes. You got a number of white spaces. So no surprise, this is what MIFID II brings us. You know, um, I, I'm... I'm not kind of um, uh, cool enough to provide a three-dimensional picture because some of those colors would need normally to be more colorful even, to be stronger. Um, and other fields, as you see, and we come to this very important topic in a moment after my presentation, like product governance, they just fill what has been missing, where the product is from and where it is being pre-selected by the distributor. So. Please keep this in mind when, you, when we think about and talk about product governance. I think this is quite important to see that this addresses here, this layer, and then for the distributor, this layer, and this is very separate from, and it, it, it is in anticipation of what is happening at the point of sale. And from a practical perspective in terms of, you know, what makes sense as a regulation um, uh, or being supervised as a new rule and what is of benefit for the client, the customer. Um, we have seen uh, in Germany, uh, if I look at documentation, and I'm not stressing this too much, we call it the Beratungsprotokoll. You know, this has been a very famous topic for many of my audit colleagues and many people I understand from the German regulator. What is the problem about it? The problem about it is that products have been brought to the market. They have been pre-selected. There has been a little bit of organization or not within the firm. Uh, and then we come to the point of sale with the information overload with a client, with a product, and the advisor has understood the product or not, you know. And then at the end, this needs to be um, documented by the investment advisor. The investment advisor needs to write down on a, on a few pa pieces of paper, uh, pages of paper, you know, why the product was suitable, what has happened. Um, the advisor cannot resolve any problems which may have occurred and may have, you know, happened before. Uh, before he was sitting or she was sitting with the, with the client, 
with the assortment of possibly 10, 15 products which may be suitable for this client or even five products. This has all been done by others, but the advisor now needs to, to put it down in writing. And therefore, the industry, together with the regulator, um, have invented the, um, the standard uh, form of the Beratungsprotokoll. So uh, on the one hand, you cannot make too much things wrong because normally you only need to tick boxes. But on the other hand, then BaFin has invented the word Freitextfeld, which means the free text, uh, free space, where you need to write down something. And this is possibly what the suitability report, in essence, means. So not only ticking boxes, but really writing down why a product is suitable, because this may help also the client. So here you see some favorite topics, but you know, I'm not going to, to uh, discuss anything. Just wanted to show you this is the, the view on the world which I come from, where, where I come from. And against the background of a number of, so I didn't mention in the beginning, if you have any question, if you want to interfere with anything, uh, uh, please shout loud uh, and you will be heard immediately. Um, so from, a, from really a number of um, a projects uh, of, of things, we, we have been talking uh, to clients where, where projects are being uh, dealt with. Um, what are, on the one hand, of course, we got the, the topics which just need to be implemented on the right-hand side to be compliant again. And I just put those which, from my point of view, are of most importance and which have at least uh, a relevant complexity of uh, being implemented properly. And what I'm more interested in, because it is just you know, a, a, um, an area where you can have discussions which then include interests of clients, include future business models, um, sustainable business models with good products, good services, um, you know, where is a strategic point where you can decide that your product, your services offering may be different than before, other than just complying with new enhanced additional rules and and and. And always say, look, the aspect or the fact that in the banking and the securities world you are full of rules of regulation, normally this shouldn't hinder you from just um, applying what is called common sense. You know, just follow your common sense, follow uh, what clients would really like, uh, but for various reasons this is very difficult. As I said before, products need to be sold somehow, investors are not aware, blah, blah, blah. Uh, not my topic here. And these are the, the, the areas which we normally face to be of strategic relevance for clients, uh, but in particular, uh, the inducements which are now going hot these days, as I understand, hotter than even before. So then a section which is a bit more of an overview, and I understand uh, that um, after me, uh, Eleftheria will uh, address this uh, more properly, uh, and I would try then to focus a bit more on the inducements if you find this are appropriate. But let's go through this. Um, yes, first of all, ju just as an, as an overview, because I thought, you know, this, this addresses what is the topic of my, uh, of my speech here. Um, you're aware we have investment services and we have uh, ancillary services, and the list of those uh, has been changed a bit, but not to a crucial extent from the investor protection perspective, I would say. Um, uh, certain things are now, I think it is, uh, it goes under a dealing on own account, um, uh, possibly that when you issue an instrument, um, just uh, at the point when it is uh, being issued first, uh, in, in former times, this may not always have been sure and clear if this was an investment service, this may be relevant for product governance purposes, I would believe, and now this also qualifies then as an investment service. But what we want to concentrate on are certain investment services only, uh, those which I think are of most practical relevance. And this is just as simple as it is, and these are non-technical terms. So you've got, uh, you're aware of the rules, I believe, so I try to show it to you, as I said, uh, in, with some colors uh, and in a practical manner. We got the advised sales, of course, non-advised sales. Um, Execution only as a specific, uh, say, sub-sector of non-advised sales and portfolio management. Um, in a, if I look at the scenery in, in Germany, um, again, in a simplified manner, execution only business, you only find in very limited scenarios. Even those who act as discount brokers and have been acting this way for a number of years, 
as far as I'm aware, they normally work on the non-advised sales appropriateness test. I'm coming to this in a moment um, uh, way. And at the same time, what my colleagues f find when auditing uh, uh, banks, including private banks, which advertise as I am, uh, uh, you know, your advisor bank. I'm not pointing to a specific one now. Uh, don't, don't misunderstand it. I'm just citing from the top of my head. Um, you're, you, we are your advisors and selecting your products. They have a ratio of 20% advised sales and 80% non-advised sales. This is what we see quite often in practice. This is the documented sales, you know. What is documented as advised and non-advised sales, and of course no one can look behind afterwards. And as a bank client, I came across a similar situation when I was asking for a product which was not on the product list for the, the, the assortment of clients which I, where I belong to. And then my advisor said, yes, I know the product, it's good. I asked for a specific fund. Uh, and I said, yes, and what about it? He said, yes, it's not on my product list, I'm sorry. And I said, couldn't I get it anyway? He said, yes, you can, but only as a non-advised sale. Uh, and then we had a further discussion on it, and I said afterwards, look, from a civil law perspective, just among us, um, this was a uh, advisory situation. You know, I said, if I buy the product, I take it on my own. I never complain about it. I only complain about your service quality, possibly, not in a legal sense. You know, I, I take it on me. Um, and you know, just as an example, and I'm quite convinced that this didn't happen only this one time with me. Possibly it did, but possibly not. So what needs to happen uh, when you are in the advisory world? You are all aware of this, and uh, Leftelier will come, come back to this in a moment, just as an overview and as a comparison of what's relevant in, in what case. And this is not really new. It was mentioned before. It was new for MIFID purposes, and for MIFID II purposes, it uh, just faces uh, and, and has certain enhancements here. Of course, you need to uh, explore the client and then the client needs to be uh, provided with an individual recommendation, you know, which uh, mirrors uh, one's uh, personal situation. And MIFID II has uh, added two, two aspects, the ability to bear losses and the risk tolerance. One can argue whether this is really new or whether, uh, and I amended it where it belongs to, if, if this is just making things more concrete. Um, and as it is mentioned in the program, just very briefly, and this will, will come with Eleftoria, I understand, uh, independent, non-independent advice. Um, the investment service is called uh, investment advice, which was on my list before. And um, there's, so to say, um, a subcategory, which is the independent advice. Uh, and so then you call, I think, normally not really technically on level two, I think you you, you, the, the, the term has been introduced in a technical way somehow. Uh, Non-independent advice, you know, is everything which is not uh, independent, just as simple as it is. Independent advice is, to be honest, not my personal favorite, and I have not really spoken to one single client who is considering these days to uh, 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 introduce uh, independent advice, other than those who have uh, done so ever before. You know, they are ones who are, uh, have a specific business model, but let's say in the normal bank, the normal intermediary I've been talking to uh, is not really considering to be an, invest, an independent advisor because on the one hand we come to it, uh, the burden and, and the, the, the level of requirements for the normal advice has been increased anyway. Uh, and so you face additional burdens and you just want, don't want to have them uh, additionally. You know, and you have, there are some information obligations. The general rules are the same which I showed on the slide before. And then, of course, you have a different uh, and additional set of obligations. Uh, I'm just showing this to you, and you will hear about this uh, in a few moments from her. The appropriateness test you're aware applies when you are working on non-advised sales as a sole intermediary without advising the client. Um, and then you just need to um, address and check whether the client's knowledge and competence with uh, experience, sorry, uh, which you have uh, uh, somehow uh, become aware of before uh, is, is fine in connection with the specific instrument. And this, this is a distinction, and this is why I have it on my slides also here, which I believe and I hope that ESMA um, will also take into account when uh, issuing those, those guidelines that for a distributor it may be really a difference whether uh, this is my business model at the point of sale or this is my business model at the point of sale, or both. 
because in anticipation of this, under product governance rules for distributors, I believe must be a different set of rules applicable uh, as you can't be obliged to, to do more on the product governance uh, than you need to, be, need to do at the point of sale. This just doesn't make any sense, I think. Uh, and finally, um, execution uh, only business, you know, this is the lowest level of obligation you can have uh, where the only thing uh, which I think needs to be sorted out generally is that you got non-complex products. There's a discussion about AIF and non-complex products and and and. Uh, just show you this ex exists also. And what we see, possibly interestingly, in practice, I call it a little bit the, so to say, the, 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 the stepchild of, of regulation um, where it appeared quite often that this is only for, you know, those wealthy uh, or, or high net worth or so people. What we see these days is that um, intermediaries become more and more interested in providing portfolio management um, for various reasons, mainly because they see the burden of compliance, the burden of the level of services quality you need to show, the cost when providing investment advice. This doesn't make any sense for further business in a black and white way. So they consider, what can I do? Do I want to provide only, uh, only non-advice sales? They, they say no. Is there another way? Uh, is there a third possibly way or a solution? And many consider to provide standardized portfolio management uh, services to clients. Um, I think this is a good idea generally. I mean, the, the level of obligations is quite similar to the advice sales. You need to explore the client before and then instead of recommending a specific product which is suitable, you need to recommend the portfolio management as such and an investment strategy which are suitable for uh, the client. And what is the good point about it from my point of view, um, you always got in the investment scenario the, the investor, the client, he or she then needs to make the decision. You know, and this can be a wrong decision of course. And afterwards, if you are the services provider, if you are the advisor, you can always say this was your decision. Here, you know, the decision, of course, on behalf of the client is made by the professional party, by the portfolio manager. So it is possibly more likely that they are good investment decisions uh, and that you can really rely on what your professional, as a client, on what your professional uh, portfolio manager does, just in a, again, black and white way. And there's further specific aspects. I just want to highlight possibly two of those. Uh, for the suitability test, and this applies both to uh, investment advice and portfolio management, um, you know, there, there is a certain kind of language in, in level two there in the delegated regulation, which is here the third point, um, that the investment firm needs to assess while I'm reading this, I, I put it uh, as it is written down in the text, while taking into account cost and complexity, whether equivalent instruments can meet the client's profile, a few years ago, uh, when I first read it, I thought this would, would have been meant to say, looking at my, my picture in the beginning, that you at least take into account the cost when assessing whether an instrument is suitable. And this showed, is what my picture showed in the beginning. Cost as such needs to be disclosed as an inducement, as cost, but as I understand, it has not been a hard aspect of the suitability test. So I thought this would be different now, but the language, at least what I can tell you from you know, the, the clients in Germany, they are not really sure if this is a hard requirement. Yeah? They tend to consider, and the language in the level two text is a bit more cloudy, that this, you know, of course, I always take into account the weather, politics, the client, the products, and then I do what I do. So we'll need to see, and you can, of course, see how you would like to have this working in practice. And what makes possibly a bit more, or causes a bit more uh, trouble and need, may also, in a positive sense, lead to uh, enhanced um, investment uh, decisions uh, that a cost-benefit analysis n needs to be done in the future, uh, in any case of switching instruments. Uh, I still don't have a concrete idea of how this will happen in practice, but I think this is another way of, you know, so, so getting tighter to things 
to, to making the suitability test more really a test when you got an outcome for the customer which is, which is good and which is not just a formal exercise. And we will hear about the documentation in a moment. And I, I talked about the German Beratungsprotokoll, my favorite one uh, just before already, which uh, is, is a, w was a national way of doing things uh, on top of what MIFID requires. So we come closer to, um, to, to where it becomes even more interesting. Um, I put it together because the program puts it together and I think it makes sense. You know, it's all about conflicts of interest I mentioned in the beginning. The, all the, the business we're talking about here is about different interests and how to get them in a certain order. From a, again, for example, very old-fashioned German perspective of civil law, all the things an intermediary is doing here, other than um, purchasing a product for a client and then selling it on to the client, but in the other senses, this is all to act in the interest of a third party. You know, these are rules, for example, in Germany from 1800 so-and-so in the commercial code, which provide for, and in the German civil code, which provide for that if you act in a way uh, as you do as, as an intermediary, as an investment advisor, as a portfolio manager, you are a trustee of the interests of the client. And it appears to me that this is not um, the awareness of day-to-day -day practice again here. Of the practice, not of the supervisors, but of those who are working with the clients and products. And I just start with a, a picture. I, I, I'm not blaming any specific bank or, or organization. Um, I'm an account holder uh, of such a bank, uh, I must admit myself. Uh, but, and I had, a med, had a, worked as a bank trainee there uh, some years ago. But I just picked it from the web. And this shows in the, in the standardized client information, which is provided to clients, for example, in Germany, um, at the beginning of the, the business relationship, and you can look at it at the web also, uh, you, you receive um, a information about conflicts of interest. You know, and, and this means here it's a presentation of potential conflicts of interest. And if you read it, and let me just put it this way, uh, you read what has been required by law, but you have not understood really what's meant, and you are, have no idea at all if conflicts of interest are such an issue, and you, they mean, look, this is such an issue, if they are such an issue, or if they're just talking about this. So this is just a way, again, in paper form, to deal with regulation. And this is what I really want to, to emphasize. Um, and if you look at the picture I showed you before, the colored one, with where everything is colored in the sales, uh, product and sales life cycle, to be honest, other than a, ban, a complete ban on inducements today, yeah, and a possibly to make product governance in practice right because people try to implement it now wrongly, um, I can't really imagine what MIFID 3 uh, can contain. So what can we have in addition? I, I'm sorry, but I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah? So uh, other than possibly trying, and you know, as I said, it is common sense which, and business sense which needs to apply, not only regulation and rules, and that's the scenario which is so difficult to get the right results of. So for conflicts of interest, and you're aware, we have very many detailed rules to address conflicts of interest. The cost transparency, again, suitability, now product governance, inducements, which I'm coming to in a moment. And we got the general rule about avoidance of conflicts of interest, you know, as a result of which this is uh, uh, told to clients. And two important aspects, and this is what I want to start with before finally addressing the inducements. Um, you got new rules, and this is from the level two regulation. You got two, two sets of sort, or sorts of important aspects you should be aware of. Um, first of all, the, the requirements for the conflicts of interest management are being made stricter, as far as I understand. So this is what you need to do uh, internally, you know, to have your conflicts of interest management, your policy, and an end. You already needed to have it somehow still, but I would believe this is a more detailed and a more sophisticated approach for that. Addressing also um, uh, senior management and, of course, compliance function. And then what's already mentioned here on the left-hand side at the bottom, and this is mentioned in the rule where it's about the management, and then it's again mentioned 
where it's about disclosure, therefore I put it here uh, uh, twice. Over-reliance on disclosure shall be considered a deficiency in the conflicts of interest policy. You know, that's one, I think it is one-to-one -one what's in the text. This is what I find quite interesting, and I'm really looking forward to how this will be supervised in practice. And at the same time, and implemented, and at the same time, um, disclosure to clients is a measure of last resort. And what is very interesting about this is, and we, you will hear, I'm sorry, I need to be aware then, but uh, you, you will hear about this, I'm sure, tomorrow. Uh, if you look what IOPA has written down in, context, in the context of IDD, uh, there have been two points in bold print everywhere. This is not a de facto ban on inducements, what we do. And the other thing is, um, disclosure is a matter of, or a measure of last resort. So you find it uh, at many places, and I, I believe that people mean it this way, and this is quite important. Um, but what does it mean? It may mean that if you discover or identify, and you possibly need some more brain to identify it than in the past, you got 70 conflicts of interest in your firm. And then you can not just put them down in your policy, and then tell the client in a more general way, or at request more specifically, what these 70 conflicts of interest are, and that you are sorry these remain. I would believe that you need to try to manage away as many of those 70 as you can, using your best efforts as an investment firm. And then if just 28 need to remain, then you can put it in your policy, and then you can uh, show this and disclose this to the client. This is what I understand is meant here with, but we need to see, and I, I see some kind of um, practical problem about looking into details of how this is being done, because we have all these you know, specific conflicts of interest preventing rules in place, which are being supervised, I mentioned before, and we talked about it, and then you got the general conflicts of interest avoidance rules, and the interrelation between both is, I think, not always clear uh, from a legal and, of course, from a practical perspective, but this is, I think, a strong message, a bold message which we all need to be aware of. Yes, and which is our favorite uh, conflict of interest? Inducements. Again, very simply, what is the current world uh, where you got commission-based uh, services? We are aware uh, in, in a country which has decided, unfortunately, not uh, uh, to, to, to be longer part of our game here, uh, but also in the Netherlands, but I think there's no one here from the Netherlands, but anyway, where, you got, where we got bans on inducement somehow in a, in a broader sense. And I think in the Netherlands to date, this is the, the strongest uh, um, regulation in that context, co covering all products and all incidents about uh, inducements. Um, and this is as simple as it is, again, the current model. Um, you know, the, the, the product provider, I put the example of a fund, an asset manager, um, you got the, the, the load fund here, 105, the client pays, and then you got the five uh, as a commission. This is, again, only a typical example, of course. Um, the, the sales com five from out, out of 105, yeah, 100 is the price for the, for the unit. Five goes to the intermediary as a sales commission, and then every year you got the trailer fee of, say, for example, one. Uh, and, of course, you know, these are the inducements in the sense of our rules. At the same time, the client allegedly does not pay anything for being advised or serviced because this is all priced in or the one is generated here during the management of the fund. So product and services, just one price tag, no one really understands what is the price of, for what. Um, and at the same time, some work on lump sum fee, on a lump sum fee basis, which is normally if you got just a custody fee, it's much less than 0 0.5. And if you got a, a co um, if you got a portfolio management, uh, this is what I want to say there, portfolio management in place, and you got the client already to pay you directly, then you hopefully get more than 0 0.5. So this is the world where we start from. And now, um, again, a lot of uh, red color here. Um, you know, this is what MIFID II makes it about. Um, just briefly, and I'm going to talk about with you uh, the quality enhancement aspect uh, uh, mainly, I think. Now we get a distinction between the various, um, uh, um, various uh, layers of, 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 of services. 
the independent advice, which was mentioned before, no commissions at all, and for the non-monetary benefits, not to have a too, too big loophole, uh, you know, only minor ones may be permissible. Um, for portfolio management, um, and this is, this is different from before, um, also prohibition of commissions, uh, and the same applies as for the independent advisor. And as I said, interestingly these days, the clients are seriously considering at least a certain of those to, to go for portfolio management knowing that they will never be able to, to get a, uh, a fee from the product provider. Um, and then we got the rest of the services. I just put it differently, but just to make it clearer, but for, for any other investment or ancillary services, the, the below rules apply. I just put the non-independent advice separately because I have a separate slide for this in a moment. And then the non-advised sales, which would fall under this category here. And what you find here is, generally speaking, other than it says uh, it's designed to enhance the quality, I think it was, so far it is a little bit like, is meant to enhance the quality or so, but this is generally the same as we have it already under MIFID 1, you know, as you're aware. And this has so far applied also to portfolio management. Now the question is, on the one hand, the existing rules stay as they are, a little bit enhanced wording, and on the other hand, the question is, is, is this the same as it is being practiced today? Yeah? Um, because this is generally prohibited already. And I must be honest, I met a number of people out there um, whom I said, look, you're aware that since 2007, when MIFID 1 was implemented, um, commissions are being prohibited. Only as a matter of exemption, you can, you can accept them. Yeah? You, you need to disclose and you, you need to provide a quality enhancement. And some people said, really? I didn't know. But the law technically says, as it does under MIFID II, it is prohibited other than. But practice as we know it is a bit different. Yeah? Practice as we know it is as if it would be generally allowed. But we are now interested in what is a quality enhancement in the future for the normal business of non-independent advice and non-advised sales. Um, and the level two delegated directive, and I, I provide it here uh, where you can find it, find it uh, if you would like to, uh, and this is the one which has now been in the, in the journal last week. Um, it provides for investment advice, non-independent investment advice, two examples of where you got a higher quality additional or higher level service, yeah, so that this justifies as a quality enhancement in the future the inducement. Uh, and there are two examples. One is you need a broader range of financial products available without being an independent advisor, or you just offer some kind of ongoing service to the client. And um, I had believed all the time, you know, that the first one you normally can implement without cost. You just need some other best friends to get products from as an intermediary. Uh, but many, of course, are in a way fixed to their kind of group of friendly product providers and intermediaries, or their, the group within their work, and they find it difficult. Uh, and the other thing I would believe clearly applies to the trailer fees, you, everything which goes on year by year. Um, the German legislator in between, and this has now been um, withdrawn, but we may see it again, has um, in the meantime, in, a few, in an earlier stage of the process in Germany, has provided a third example. And the third example, and there was some correspondence with, between FAIR, with the Commission and others, uh, yeah. and the third example was uh, if you provide for the um, availability of advisory services by a widespread branch network in rural areas. You can consider yourself whether these two examples as to a higher level of quality of service and the other example about the infrastructure are equal. Possibly one, one can have different views about it, but anyway. Um, and then there's another example for non-advised sales. Uh, in my observation, a number of people have not 
really understood what this means. I have seen a number of occasions where, um, oh yeah, I'm coming to the end in a moment, where the where people thought that this is another example for advised sales. I believe it is not. It is the third, you know, in the list, in the, in the delegated directive. Um, and if you look into one of those recitals, I can tell you the number if you would like to. The recital says for advised sales and blah, 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 and then it shows the two examples on the previous slide. And then it goes on for other services, such as non-advised sales, and then it shows this, this example. So reading properly, normally you can't go ahead with alleging that this is an example for, that, it, that this enhances the quality of an investment advice. Because I would believe investment advice is already of high quality, and then you need to have something in addition. And for non-advised sales, you know, the level is lower, and then you can come with this, and you see there's some double language compared to the other examples, as again, products are mentioned and what you can need to do. So I, I called it products and or services, and I called it tools. So this is just the way uh, I, I tend to understand that. And then coming to the end now, uh, looking at the clock, um, there are other rules in addition, you know, which try to make this more tight. Here's another, um, an, another mentioning of the ongoing benefits. So I'm I would tend to believe, but again, this is unclear uh, today, if you have the infrastructure example, for example, in Germany, and if you look at the, the list here, um, I would believe that if you have an ongoing benefit, and this is very important for the intermediaries, uh, at least in Germany, as far as I'm aware, um, then you need to fulfill uh, this kind of example-like uh, scenario with an ongoing service somehow. You cannot just say, I got a branch network and therefore I'm dispensed of, of this requirement because then in addition the second one here applies. And then, then possibly finally here and the other slides I'm going through just uh, to, to show you what's in and you can, you can read it uh, afterwards if you'd like to. Um, and this is what we have in Germany already. We call it uh, Zuwendungs- uh, und Verwendungsverzeichnis, which means you need to um, have a list of where you get your inducement from and how you spend it. And again, and um, Bafin people um, may already wonder about what I'm telling here, but I, I tend to say um, you, you can fulfill the requirements, and that's the purpose of it, because we don't have a ban on inducements uh, to date in Germany, to fulfill the requirements, for example, of that documentation obligation in Germany, if you can properly, I always say, read, write, and calculate. Yeah? You can normally do, do not anything wrong about it. The question is if this comes in addition if you don't already have it. So this will more or less, I believe, stay in Germany. But the question is, what can I put in? You know, how high is, is the level I need to fulfill? Can I just say I paid it for IT, I paid it for personal, I paid it for, for my, my branch house? Or do you should need to show that there's re a real enhanced quality? What I believe was the purpose of the rules. Um, uh, but this is still. Uh, debated and I believe people now these days become more and more aware as national implementation of these rules comes closer until mid of this year uh, what comes up there. Um, disclosure is what you already know, the minor monitoring benefits we, we can't address here. Uh, I'm just uh, showing you the slides. Research is another interesting point uh, but I need to come to the end. If you would like we can discuss it separately. Um, Again, this came up a little bit, uh, bit, bit at, at, an, at a late stage. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it's, it may have come up from by the FCA, uh, who has issued a paper on this, uh, addressing that uh, when you uh, kind of root orders for execution and at the same time you get uh, research, then there's no clear distinction between uh, commissions you pay for execution of orders and cost of research. And Clearly, this may really be an inducement. What I find interesting about it, if you read Article 13, I think it only says what I got under exception. Uh, this shall not be regarded as an inducement if. Uh, the principle here, I think you don't find it there. Um, but I would just believe this means that the principle is that this is an inducement. And if you want to look into, uh, to find a definition, I've only found it in the recital there. And this uh, is causing some trouble to people. What I believe and what we see these days, and I think this is my final slide, and thanks for your patience so far, um, 
the fund industry, the portfolio managers, I mean, the fund industry is technically not the addressee of MIFID II, that's true, and this will come possibly as a next step under USITS 5, 6, whatever. Um, what we understand is that people are considering not to use, uh, maybe not to use these technically specific cumbersome uh, possibilities of research payment accounts, but just pay out of their own money. But as a second step, and this is not addressed by this regulation uh, or directive, um, just to charge the client for this. And we had a number of discussions with, with fund providers, and they said, and interestingly, and then you again see, and this is my conclusion, the difference between the intention of rules and how it ends up, they say, for those funds which are being made for the general public investor, we, can, we, we have a new clause in our fund terms. Yeah? Um, possibly it has been uh, charged to the fund anyway before, but then I pay it as an asset manager and I just charge it to the fund. And for the private investor, they say, we tend to do it this way. But for the sophisticated institutional investor where they got their special funds, and this is a big part of the industry, for example, in Germany, they say, we are not sure because the client will then start to discuss costs and charges, what the private investor doesn't do because he doesn't understand. So that, that, again, is a point, you know, funds for private investors are more costly than funds for, for professional investors, uh, and that's one of the, the things where it ends up. And again, future models, yeah, I need to be quite, quite short here. Um, my only message is don't believe people who say there are only two ways, the commission-based model here with the inducements or the independent fee-based model. Um, these are two things which are addressed by regulation. Regulation addresses what is an inducement and what needs to be done or not. If you get the client to pay you, if you as an intermediary get to pay the client here, other than as an independent advisor and other than an advisory fee, if you charge a transaction fee, if you charge a service fee, if you charge a lump sum fee, you get rid of any discussion with compliance, with your auditor, with the regulator about inducements. You know, it's just not applicable. And the independent advisor rules don't apply also. Um, there's no prescription. It's, again, common sense. And it's a question of what is the client prepared to pay, of course. But, you know, don't believe people telling you there must be the commission-based or the fee-based business model. There are many, many things which can take place in between. And the more people you got on the picture, the more complicated it is, of course. And finally, and then you, you suffered enough, and I... I'm, I'm just um, leaving the stage at, at, um, at this point, and, and thanks again for your time. Um, the robo-advisor, I think, will be one of those um, players which make a difference in the future. The more, and this is what we see, the more a bank and the more implementation, and this is what we see for product governance, ends up as just a question of how do I get it implemented in my system? How do I get it so that my advisor, my staff only need to press a button? Yeah? It is all technical. It is all IT-based. But at the same time, if you afford to pay your personnel, to pay your branch, and, and, and. And th those guys here do it for the portion of the fee. You as a bank will be only second winner. And finally, what is very interesting in Germany, robo-advisors normally do not advise because this doesn't really make any sense. They sometimes provide information. And of course, it's a matter for the regulator to consider if something they do qualifies as advice. I mean it from the client's perspective in terms of what makes sense. Those who are successful today in Germany provide portfolio management. So again, you may hear a bell ringing, not as loud possibly, uh, still, but these are certain kind of developments I just wanted to make you aware of in the context of all the complex MIFID environment. And this is it for the moment. Finally, thanks a lot. Okay.